the Lord Jesus, I'm sure, was a fascinating preacher. Buddha, when he died, said that he was speaking truth, but Jesus, when he began to preach, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody could add to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Intuitively, and because of the fact that he, his relationship with God <coughs> put him beyond all other teachers, and yet we're told that many were offended at his doctrine. Again, there's something in man that bucks up against whatever's been taught which is contrary to their personal disposition. There are many things in this fifth chapter which are um, very offensive. I know we talk peace. Mr. Carter said at the beginning of his administration that he was going to push for peace, but he's selling more armaments than I don't know who. It's a strange thing that uh, we're, we're supplying arms to the world so they can kill each other as long as they keep off us. I don't understand politics. In case you don't know, politicians don't either, but there it is. One of the, one of the most offensive things about the Sermon on the Mount, it's very beautiful, and I say, there are different ways of interpreting it. Some say, well, uh, here, this is, this is beautiful, but this is really a social gospel. Others say it's just an elaboration, it's just an increase of wisdom on the Ten Commandments. Others relegate it and say, well, you know, it's for the millennium, when the lion lays down with the lamb. But what in the world is the good of preaching it then? Everybody's going to be righteous. There's going to be no war. God is going to restore the earth. If you've, ever, if you've ever thought of that hymn when you sing, he walks with me and talks in that, I always think of Adam and Eve in the garden. It must have been very wonderful to walk and talk with God in the garden. And when you think that you could take a lion and have it for a pet, it have no offensive odors, even the skunk was decent in those days. And uh, everything was beautiful. And God is going to restore the world again to that stake for a thousand years. I believe in the millennium, a lot of people don't, but I believe it. I think it's there clearly in the Word of God. So, the millennial age is going to be compulsory righteousness. It's going to be wonderful. You, you, if you're around, you won't have to lock the door. <laughs> there won't be any policemen, there won't be any war machines. Everything is going to be restored as it was away there in the days of Adam. And so people say, this is describing that period. I think you'll find Scofi is terribly weak here, like he is in so many other things. He postpones this thing. Now, what's the good of telling me that this Sermon on the Mount is for a few today, to the millennium? Uh, there happens to be a phrase in it that says this, ye are the light of the world. What do we need the light of the world in the millennium for? Everything's like... With the salt in the midst of curse. The only reason why fire isn't falling from heaven now as it is on Sodom and Gomorrah is not because of legislation. It's because of the church of Jesus Christ. You know, you, you, it, it's easy to go back to history or anywhere else and uh, say, you, you make a circle like this and you, you, you put inside that circle everything that's vile and rotten and corrupt in governments, in personalities, the jailbirds, everything else, put it all there. You don't judge the world by the worst that's in it. You judge the world by the best that's in it, which is free. The church is always, she, she may have spots and wrinkles, she may be bad, but she is still, to some degree, the conscience of the world. She is the only light God has in the world. And so you don't judge the world by all the rottenness that's in it. If the church is sick, if she's down here and weak, then the world's going to be worse because of the weakness of the church. If she's strong and healthy and powerful, as the anointing of God. After all, we, 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 we get over the miracle of the... The men in the upper room a bit too easily, I think. That bunch of men in the upper room, well, well, who were they? Well, they were a bunch of weaklings and failures. They were there for ten days. Again, they had had forty days of probation. They'd been in the presence of the risen Son of God. We're on probation now, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is, we say this is the age of the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. You and I are under test in this dispensation because of the availability and I'll finish my message Sunday morning on to believers tonight. The judgment of believers is going to be something. To me, it shades the judgment of sinners. It's more awesome. It's more terrifying. It's more penetrating. It's more searching. If you obey it, if you believe it, it's more adjusting. It's more rectifying. It's more healing. 
You know, sometimes when I've been out west, I followed a truck down the road, and I hardly knew what I was driving. I'm, I'm driving in a, a, a cloud of dust for miles. You know, that's how most Christians live, even. We live in the dust of time. We do not see the things of eternity. It's a beautiful story, story, but turn your eyes upon these. The things of earth become strangely dim. You know, we're very good at amputating the truth. You, you'll see a, a, a sign in a, in a shop, in a Christian bookstore maybe. Here it is. And it's got, this is a sign to go on your wall. We'll be better than that. One, two, three, four lines. But uh, by some strange uh, happening, we have obliterated the two lines. So what do we say in the first two lines? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for God will last. Amen. But that's not what it says. The other two verses, lines are just as pungent. Only one life shall soon be passed. Only what's done for God will last. And when I am dying, how glad I shall be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for me. Now that makes all the difference. To, to, you see, that's the whole thing. Now why do we amputate it? Why do we cut it off? Because we don't think about dying and the lamp of our life going out and having to, you know, we much rather have the first two verses, two lines, eh? Only one life will soon be passed. Only one chance for God will last. Boy, we saw that about. It sounds real smart. Now, don't you get the idea that all the Christians die victorious? Christians that time, the Christians die squealing and unhappy. You know why? Because when they get to the edge of the eternity and there's no U-turn. Now, keep that in mind. There is no U-turn. Life is a one-way road. You can't make a U-turn. That is in years anyhow. And when you get to the edge of eternity, you begin to see the things of earth have gone strangely then. You have no option about it now. Because you're going into eternity. But what do I have to take? I'm sure I don't take my Bible school notes. It's go to your Bible or something. All I take in is character. And character is God's willingness to work in my life and shape me and fashion me and prune me and correct me and discipline me. Well, that's all through the book, isn't it? Whom the Lord loveth, he what? And then what? All right, don't you think the first part was enough? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and then scourgeth every son. And if you're not scourged, he uses a word, we, we've turned all the words round. It's a big old ugly Bible word, we're bastards and not sons. You see, if God is allowing something to come into your life, don't blame the devil or your mother-in-law or anybody. If some situation has come in your life that perplexes you now, you know what you should do? The first thing you should do is thank God for it. Now, that, you, you've got to have some grace to do that, haven't you? Maybe you've been courting and engaged, and the night before the wedding, the fellow comes and says, you know, I think we're through. You say, well, praise the Lord, I wanted to get rid of you a long while, but... You've made it so easy for me, I want to thank you. Oh, you said tears. Now listen, if, if he's going to break it off there, it's better to break it off the night before the wedding than the night after the wedding, so forget it. If he's going to sit in the seat, of course, it works for the ladies too, but if she says, I don't think so, well, go back to your mother. But, uh, you see, the thing is this, there are, tests, there are perplexities in life. Now listen, I remember Dr. Sanks of Westminster saying to me once, he said, Brother Raymond, I have no shallow interpretations for the will of God. Some people have. When I was lying apparently dying in hospital, everybody that came in quoted Romans 8.28. I didn't know it was in the Bible so many times. But everybody that came in quoted Romans 8.28. That's a, that's a cop out. That's easy enough. Why does God bring me into this situation? Well, you say, if I have a burden now ten times bigger than, 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 uh, than I had a few weeks ago, is this God's favor? Yeah, I think it is. Why? Well, one thing he says that he won't allow you to be tempted above what you're able. And as a little boy, I uh, remember going in the garden before going to school, and my dad would be digging those nice English potatoes, and, and uh, I'd go pick up a bucket, and he'd say, No, no, no. You can't lift that bucket. Train your back. I was about five years of age. When I was 15, I tried to skip the bucket, and he said, Len, pick it up. Won't it help my back? Hurt your back, you could carry three of those things. Come on. He used to tell me, but you've grown up. You see. I got the alibis, but he got something more, and so I obeyed him. 
See, my dad was a good Methodist. He believed in the laying on of hands, and he could lay them on at times. I'll tell you that. <coughs> and you know, the Lord is like that. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth. And that's that's a that's a, a very very rough word. It implies taking some flesh away. But that's not because he's angry. It's because he loves us. You see, we're not saved by work, but keep this very clear in your little minds. You're not going to be graded in eternity by what you know. You'll be judged for it, sure enough. We're going to be graded by what we do. We're not saved by work. We're rewarded for work. I had a friend on a motorcycle. He always had trouble with it. Somebody said, well, what, what makes it? He said, it's faith. Faith? What do you call it faith for? I said it's without work. <laughs> well, uh, faith without work is dead, the scripture says. Now, you read, about, uh, you, you, you read about one of the greatest characters ever in the word of God, Abraham. What do you read about him? He was justified by faith. So he was. Before God. He was justified by work. Before men. If your faith doesn't work, you can have all the theological cliches that you like and shibboleth. They don't make sense. Why should we take any notice of your faith doesn't work? So what are you telling me about? So James says that faith without work is dead. It is a dead faith. It's a defunct faith. It's a fruitless faith. I'm very interested in the... I don't listen to radio preachers anymore. I never learn anything anyhow, hardly. You know, they always tell me what they can do. They can raise the sick and raise the dead, but they can't raise money. Isn't that wonderful? I'd much rather they raise money and forget about the dead, because I'm not dead. And I'm not sick, as, I, as far as I know, really. I've got a lot of pain, sure enough. I've had that ever since I had my accident. But by the same token. I don't have to believe those men talking about faith. You see, part of the Sermon on the Mount again is what? A friend of mine, he's a doctor, a very brilliant doctor. And he specializes in, um, what does he specialize in? Uh, open heart surgery. And he has three children, and he bought them all Bibles a few years ago at Christmas, and he had stamped on the cover their names, and then he had Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first. I tried to drill it into the minds of my boys. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things, all the things in the Sermon on the Mount, will be added unto you. Your children don't go to bed restless at night wondering if they'll have breakfast. I remember coming to the States once and the boys lined up and said, Daddy, would you bring me this, please? Will you bring me this? Will you bring me this? And I promised them I would. And I got two of the presents. I did not get the third. You know that boy, that, the boy that didn't get the gift was... He said, Daddy, you mean you didn't get it? He thought I should have gone to the White House and asked for presents. I mean, I promised him a gift. I didn't get it. I looked all over New York before I left on the boat. But I couldn't get the... He was astounded. He couldn't believe it. You've been in England, you've, you've been in America six months, and you left it for the last two days. He thought I was going to get it and carry it everywhere on the plane, everywhere I went. And somebody says, what's this? And he knocked my eye out. Say, well, it's all right for my son. I don't care about you being inconvenienced and sitting on this seat here. My son wants it, he's going to get it. Wouldn't it be lovely? You see, maybe part of the reasoning of Jesus is, uh, except ye be converted and become as little children, they've put your pure faith, haven't they? How many, read your, how many of you read the book of Demon Shikarians on the happiest people in the world? Did you read that? It's a bit expensive, I think, for the fact. Well, well, get a copy and read it. And you know, so much of that stuff worked through a boy, what, 11 years of age, I think he was. The prophecies, the revelation, hundreds of lives were saved through one boy, 11 years of age, that heard the voice of God. And people believed in new God. You see, there's a simplicity. We become, I say sometimes, God gave us the Bible and man invented theology to confuse it. As I said this, this past week, as we talked with those missionaries, they said, well, when they teach people up in the wilds of Papua, New Guinea, I've been up there, it's rough country. But when they teach them that this is the book of God, this is the book of truth, it has no lies in it. The mighty God up there has no failure. He has no limitations. His wisdom is as vast as the ocean, which some of them have seen and most of them haven't. It's difficult to describe to people up there things about God. You tell them about a vine, they've never seen a vine. You, you say, it can make you whiter than snow. What snow? They've never seen snow. You've got problems. I try to pray, I hope I do anyhow, every day for the Wycliffe translators. It's an enormous job. 
My daughter-in-law is translating a, a finish just now, making a vocabulary and a grammar for the, uh, in the Bue language in, in the Ivory Coast. Been years at it. Her mother has taken 25 years to reduce one of the tribal languages and write the New Testament, which I think Wycliffe has published. It's an enormous job. I remember one thing that I said to the fellows last night was this, that, that you, know, you read these stories and, uh, and when you read stories of how God made, uh, well, C.T. Sturb and how God made Hudson, uh, um, Hudson Taylor of the China Inland Mission. It's wonderful. Or how God uh, worked in the life of uh, who? Martin Luther. And we tip our hats to these men saying, man, I'm glad. And that man was a martyr. This man was a martyr. I'm glad they laid down the last drop of their blood for the Lord. But we're careful we don't lay down the first drop of ours. Now that doesn't mean you have to die with somebody chopping your arm or your leg off. Again, it could be uh, you shed your blood this way that you're on a, a brilliant career. I don't know if I told you about this young man last week that told us in business he made $58,000 the first day, 58000 the second, 40 the third, lost 30 the fourth. And got up to about a quarter or half a million dollars, I don't know, a million, I, there was some million in it, I didn't catch it. Then the next day when he prayed, the Lord said, give every penny away, and he did. I think that's beautiful. To me, that's shedding his blood. As much as dying a martyr, because again, he's cut off all his income, he has a wife and he has children. Here's a man goes to the mission field. Suddenly, here's a man and he's set on a course to be a doctor. And he's graduated with honors, and he's not only a doctor, he's a surgeon, he can do operations and so forth. And he's got an eye, his eye on a piece of property, and he's got his eye on a girl, and maybe just married her. And everything's going to go well, as let me, let me turn the uh, argument here to uh, Henry Martin. He was the most brilliant man in the university. He, uh, at 20, 20 years of age, he carried off the Smith Prize at, where was he, at Cambridge, I think, where nobody had ever carried off at that, age, at that age. He was a senior wrangler in the university. He was a brilliant orator. And he fell in love with a girl called Lydia. Hmm, you know, the most beautiful girl in the world. So now he's all ready to have a great career. Maybe he'll become a don in the university. Who knows, he might become the chancellor or he might become the president of the university. And he's praying one day and the Lord said, not Libya, first India. And he said, get confused if you weren't careful. Lydia and India sound very much, uh, you know. And he said when he prayed, in one ear he could hear a voice saying, India, the other, Lydia, Lydia, India, India, Lydia. Which way am I going here? So he went to her one day and he said, well, my dear, um, we're going to India. Who, who's going to India? You and I, we're going to be married. No, 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 no. I, I married an intellectual. I married a man with a, uh, a career all carved out for him. The most brilliant scholar. In fact, uh, he was called the most perfect gentleman in the Victorian era, the end of the Victorian era. He, he just oozed grace and brilliance and charm and personality and courtesy and, and genius. He was at home. I, I've got a son like that. He takes after uh, his mother. But uh, <coughs> I've got a son like that. He's at home anywhere. He has an own PhD, so enough. He's been going to school. I think he went to school when he was three and a half and he has a PhD and he's still going to school. He wants to learn, 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 learn. Well, you can do that all your life. It has to have its place. But anyhow, here he is loaded with everything, scholarship, everything everybody wants. And Lydia thought, boy, I've got the prize catch of the university. And so she talks to him and says, well, look, my dear, uh, you've got to make a choice. Lydia or India, not India and Lydia. Now, that's tough. If you haven't been that way, you don't know anything about it. It tears roots up inside. You can be as sanctified and spirit-filled as you like and raise the dead if you want. But one of these days, something's going to tear you, if I could use a word that's common these days, on the gut level, it's going to tear you right in the middle of your emotional life. It's distinct from your spiritual life. It's distinct from your physical life. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. The inner man of your being, your willpower, your emotions, your reactions, so forth, they're all there. You're still human. There's no experience this side of eternity will make you inhuman. As a matter of fact, the nearer you get to God, the more refined every appetite becomes, the more sensitive you become. It isn't that you take offense more easily, but it is that that sensitiveness in you immediately shies. You know, uh, if you go to England, you, you, you should go to the Assize Court. The judge comes in in a flowing robe right to his feet, and he has about two and a half inches of ermine, beautiful ermine with little black tails in he has a wig down to his shoulders. It's a very impressive thing. It's a good rehearsal for the judgment day. But 
You know, that little learning, there's only one way they can catch it. And that is the hunter stays behind a tree and he watches the little thing run out to get some food. And when he goes out, he takes filth and puts it round the hole, puts dirty oil round the hole. And when that little thing runs back, it's going to go in the hole and it's that it will not pollute itself with the uncleanness that they put round the hole. It will be killed first. Now, you know, we become sensitive, like at least we ought to. I think if you wake up, I, 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 I don't sleep, I slept maybe two hours last night. I don't sleep when I get on the burden for the things of God, it doesn't worry me too much. I get tired sure enough. But at your age, usually you don't. But if you do wake up two or three o'clock in the morning, I think you should ask God why you woke up. Maybe he wants to talk to you. I get most things from God between two and four o'clock in the morning, you see, he's not so busy at that time. At least not in America, he's busy with the other half of the world, but right here, everybody's, you know, snorting away. So, so there, there, there's, there's going to be a challenge. There's nothing in you that God will not allow to be challenged. He allows everything to be challenged. And I say again, you don't have to bleed physically with, with flesh and blood. You can bleed like he did. He said, well, this breaks my heart. But Lydia, Jesus first. You know, the little acrostic, you learn this at school, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, yourself last, makes J-O-Y. And it's the only God there is. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. He went to India. He translated the New Testament out of, out of the original Greek into, pardon me, into Arabic. A more difficult language than Greek. You know, it, it's not what you have and bring to God that matters. Do you know that? Now, it's easy to stand and sing, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all, and hold back. But you see, it's not what you have, it's what God has to give you if you're obedient. For if you forget for a moment the brilliant young man that went to India by the name of Henry Martin. And who was the other man that went? Carey. You know Carey learned a dozen languages while he was there? And I don't think he had more than a... Well, I guess Tozer, I've got something in common with Tozer. I finished school in the eighth grade, and I think this other fellow did. doesn't mean you become a genius if you finish in the eighth grade or anything else, but it does mean this, you see, that there are, there are two areas, and don't forget them, there are two areas of wisdom. Oh, my blackboard's always in the mess. Okay. There is this wisdom here, which is scholastic, we'll say, escholastic, and there is this hemisphere of wisdom, which is, I'll put A, from above. There is a wisdom of the earth and there is a wisdom which belongs to God. Therefore, again, saturate yourself in the, in the book of wisdom. Saturate yourself in the book of Proverbs. Come unashamedly to God. I tell God I don't have to blush in his presence because of my ignorance. I don't have to blush. I might blush before some people if they caught me out on a, in a situation, but I don't have to blush before God. You see, the logic of Scripture is, is, is reverse logic. You say, I want to go up. Well, I'll tell you how to go up. Go down. I'll tell you how to go down. Go up. In your own energy, in your own flesh, in your own conceit. He that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You say, well, I've only one life and I want to save it. Good, that's a gr I'm glad you do. You know how to save it? Give it away. If you keep it, you lose it. Who loses, whoso ever loses his life for my sake? You shall find it. Again, I, my, my hero in the New Testament after Jesus is the Apostle Paul. I think he's the greatest intellect the world ever saw. And yet you remember he writes to a church and he says, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Do you know, what, do you know the great advantage of having nothing? You can't lose anything. If you've no opinion of yourself, nobody will ever hurt you. If, you. if you get hurt, it's because you have some conceit in your life. You think you're better than they say they are. A fellow came to me a while ago, he said, I don't like your preaching. He said, shake hands, I don't like it either. It would be a lot better than it is. You won't get me that way. <clears throat> Paul says we have nothing. Hey, but wait a minute. He's talking about this area of the world. He says we have nothing. And yet he says, we possess all things. 
Now, what do you want to do? Possess all things and have nothing, or, to, or have no? And I'm not thinking in the material. I'm thinking inside yourself. You have no conceit about your personality, your ability, or anything else. You let the Lord take care of the whole lot. Now, old Lucifer's pretty clever. You know, he's had about six thousand years studying human nature. But I'll tell you one thing: Lucifer can't do. He can't hit nothing. You remember what Jesus said? The prince of this world cometh and findeth what? Nothing in me. The thing that made Lucifer blaze was there was no ground he could work on in Jesus. Aren't you having a bad time? I came into the world to have a bad time. Aren't you going to be betrayed? I came into the world. Jesus is the only person who came into the world with the intention of dying. That was his mission. How he got there didn't matter. I came to do thy will, oh my God. Somebody asked me just now, what's the secret of spiritual power? I believe two things. Number one, obedience. The second one, prayer. I think every day you live, you should sing the old hymn of my granny's, my granny's favorite hymn. I, l I still love it. Trust and obey. There's no other way. Isn't that wonderful? You could go to a theological seminary and not learn that. Trust and obey. There's no other way. You can go around it this way, go around it that way, and you're still running to the same roadblock. Trust and <laughs> obey, there's no other way. Now, the big offense about this marvelous message of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is that he finishes in the 7th chapter, verse 48, and he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Oh, boy, that gets under our skin. You know what? I, th this is what the Lord seems to say to me this morning. It's not merely true that people in the world do not believe the word of God. The people in the church do not believe the word of God. Many of the believers do not believe the word of God. If somebody says to you, what are you striving for in your spiritual life? You say to be perfect. Oh, come on now, come on now, no, that's ridiculous. Nobody's perfect. Huh? <clears throat> Did God make Adam perfect? Did he make the world perfect? Was his son perfect? Well, forget all your theology right here and, and just uh, figure here that Jesus Jesus here lives on a peak of here, this is where Jesus lives this is a, a, a peak for Jesus of obedience and so forth and this is where I live and I'm supposed to live on exactly the same level as Jesus Why? Well, I'll tell you because the scripture says this As he was, so are we in the world to come No, in this world As he was, so are we in this world. What was it? He was in total subjection to his father's will. Supposing you're going to buy a watch. Somebody gave me this nice watch. I'd be happy to give me the money. I think it cost five hundred dollars. It's gold. That's ridiculous. But the man said he was led to give me it, and I was led to take it. So uh, <coughs> I've got a good watch. But supposing I went into a shop. And I said to the man, uh, he said, uh, do you want to watch? I say, yeah, I like that one there. Um, and he says, well, I'll tell you about this watch. It certainly is beautiful. And you see, instead of having numbers, it has diamonds and uh, it's got diamonds round. And it's, it's a beautiful watch, but, um, you know, it's about the worst watch I have. It doesn't keep time. Oh, I don't bother about keeping time. I mean, I'm an evangelist. I want to lift my arm up like this and everybody see my diamonds. And have another bangle here, a dog thing, you know, so... Uh, and I want everybody to see what I've got. I mean, that's what you do as an evangelist. You've got to impress. <clears throat> uh, and I say, I'm not bothered about the time. Just that it looks good. Give me anything. You don't do that, do you? You go see a lovely car and you say, that's a lovely model. That's a beautiful car, isn't it? Yeah, it is. How much do you want for it? He says, well, it's a 77 Cadillac. I'll take uh, 300 for it. For a 77 Cadillac? Yeah, why? Uh, well, the man's already spent 4,500 in repairs and it still won't go. But you can have it for $300. Say, no, thank you. Why not? Looks too good, looks too great. It just doesn't function properly. Well, God made us to function properly. And the expense, if you want to know what it is, was Gethsemane and Calvary in the resurrection. That was it. I talked with a man the other day who was talking all the time about his investments. Okay, do you know the greatest investment God ever made 
was when he invested his redemptive work in you. That's his investment. And he isn't looking for somebody faulty and spasmodic and prayerless and powerless. He's looking for somebody who aspires to be conformed to the image of his Son. Be ye therefore perfect. Look up Peter. Do you know what Peter says? Well, it says of us that we should follow in his steps. Whose steps? Jesus. What are the steps? Well, if we were left to put them in, we'd, we'd mess it up. But he says, these are the steps who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now, those are two toughies. You can think over them and then read the rest of the chapter. This is what God designed in my life. Yes, he said that, we, that Jesus came, that we should follow in his steps, like you follow somebody's footprints through the snow. And the steps of Jesus was this, he did no sin and no guile was found in his mouth. Now again, you've got to differentiate between sin and faults and all the rest of it. I'm not doing that right here. But he said, be ye therefore perfect. Well, uh, I'll tell you, like I said, that diamond, you know, and it flashes off here, it says sanctification, and over there it says uh, full, full with the Spirit, and over here it says dying to sin. All different aspects of the same thing. Now, you could make a diamond there and, uh, and ask people now about being perfect in Christ. And they've got more answers than sparks off an anvil. You see. And one of them they usually shoot out. Listen, you know what Paul says in Romans 7? They that are in the flesh cannot please God. I'm glad that's there. But it isn't there. It's in Romans. I'll find, I'll find it. There you are. There's the verse. Somewhere around about five or six. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. But the chapter doesn't end there. Go down two further verses. And what does it say? Ye are not in the flesh. Now what do you do? The flesh has been dealt with or should have been dealt with at the cross. Justification deals with my past. However filthy my record is, God takes that record and he tosses it in the sea of his forgetfulness. Sanctification deals with my heart, deals with my nature. After Romans 5, uh, oh goodness where, Romans 5, 10 or 12, notice a change. The apostle does not talk about S-I-N-S. He talks about S-I-N, sin. The sin that made me do the sin, that made me do the sins. Because he's dealing, he's dealing with what, with what oh, anyhow, the theologians call it, or some people call it the old nature. Now look, if you have a root here, there's the ground level. If you have a root in here, and a tree going up here, and branches and fruits on and all the rest, you can cut that tree off like that, but if you don't get rid of the root, it's going to come up again. So if God deals with the root, then... The other part's not going to be bearing all the corruption it's born before. Now, sure enough, sin is not a root that you can extract like a rotten tooth. Sin is a disposition. And I believe that, that, that one... Uh, um, I believe that um, 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth. But if you take the Greek, you'll discover that... They, look, it, it's like this. Here is a... We used to do this when we were boys at home. We... We go to the river, here's, here's the level of the river. And we pick up a rock, uh, here's a rock and it, it has mud on it. Oh, it looks ugly. We throw it in that river, and as it went in that river, the floor of the river would wash off the mud. And the rock would be down there clean. We go back a day or two after, somebody say, Hey, Raven, you threw that rock in the river, there it is. Look how clean it is. Why? Because there's a continual flow of water over it. If I take it out and put it over here, it's going to get polluted again. Now, if I stay in subjection, if I believe God to cleanse me, to purify my heart by faith, which is Acts 15, 8 and 9, if I believe the blood to cleanse me, I'll stay clean as long as I stay in the place of obedience. If I get defiled, I go back. For it says, if we sin, not when we sin, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, an argument that's used so very, very often, when you talk about, um, uh, when you talk about perfection, Somebody comes up and says, well, uh, I'll tell you what. Um, uh, as I said, Paul says that uh, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They seize hold of that. You know, sometimes I think almost that many preachers are devil's advocates. They're always trying to defend sin and corruption. Now, if there is no purity of heart, and after all, that's a great thing again. It's called here perfection. It's called earlier in the chapter, the pure in heart. Well, keep thy heart, for out of it come all the corruptions of things, isn't it? 
Out of the heart proceed as what? Murder, envy, strife. The heart of the problem is the heart of man. Again, our problem is we cannot live together. The great problem here is the number one problem. And this, 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 uh, this, this uh, deals with it. Our number one problem is human relationships. In the world, in the nation, in the home, in the church. Human relationships. You get that brittle offensive thing that wants to fight and argue and have its own way. Now why did Adam get kicked out of the Garden of Eden? Did he get drunk? No? Did he beat his wife up? Did he cut the trees down to make a log cabin? What did he get kicked out for? He's going to have his own way, right? Not like God. I, God's not going to rule up. That's the very thing Lucifer got kicked out of heaven for. That's why he wanted to work. He works on, on Adam because he's angry that he got kicked out of, of, of heaven, got kicked out of eternity. So he says, he fell I'll make him for. And Adam got kicked out of him. Pardon me. Uh, Satan got kicked out of him. He wanted his own way. He wanted to sit on the circle of the earth like he wanted to be like God. And he couldn't get it. So he says, hey, you can be like God though. I'll tell you how to be like God. God doesn't want you to have power and authority. And he was corrupted. But he was made perfect. In the beginning. All right. So if you talk about... Um, Uh, being perfect. Somebody's going to shoot this at you. Where is it? In Philippians? What does Paul say? Philippians, Philippians, where is it? Here it is. Philippians 3.12 Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. There's your answer. The greatest man you say that lived after Jesus says, I'm not perfect. Right. So I lost that round. But uh, could I suggest to you that there are some other verses in the chapter, namely the 15th? Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Now what do you do? Well then it's a contradiction. No, 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 no. He's talking about two different things there. Verse 12, not as though I had already attained or were already perfect, but I follow after that which I may be apprehended for that which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the resurrection. You haven't got all that's coming to you. I don't care if you have every gift of the Spirit and you're the best known man in the world. So what? You, you still lag behind something like I do. What? The last gift I get from God is a body like unto his glorious body, a resurrection body. Some of you, I may read C.S. Lewis. I heard C.S. Lewis preach once. I was amazed at the man. I was amazed at his simplicity. I was amazed at the fact that he said, I feel so confined in this little mind of mine, I long to get a glorified body and a glorified intellect. And I thought, boy, you'll be somebody when you get that. You're somebody now in my, in my book. What a marvelous man. But he says, I'm longing, I'm striving. I, I want God to give me a glorified body, which I can't have right now. Now, Paul says here, I, stri I, I want perfection. One day we're going to have a perfect body, a perfect mind. Everything in us is going to be perfect. Why? Because we're going to have a body like what? Gabriel? No, I don't want a body like Gabriel. Like who? Right. Like unto his glorious body? Woo! Won't that be something? Eh? Like that body he had on the Mount of Transfiguration which blinded those fellows and they found a body like unto his glorious body, a mind like his mind, a will like his will. This is this is all the, the final package deal, if you like, of redemption or being filled with the Holy Ghost and gifts of the Spirit. We're going to have a body like unto his glorious body. But he says in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. For if otherwise in anything ye be otherwise minded, even God should reveal this unto you. If your aspiration is to know God in his fullness, He's going to keep revealing and revealing and revealing and revealing. Well, as I said yesterday, you can't have atomic perfection. That's all gone. You can't have angelic perfection. As I look around, I see you don't. But anyhow, you can't have angelic perfection. You can't have physical perfection. You can't have mental perfection. What you can you have? You can have spiritual perfection. What is Perfection. Perfection is a thing functioning completely 
uh, in the capacity for which it was made. I've got a card out there. That banana coloured card out there is mine. I'm embarrassed to tell you it's an old model. It's last year. <laughs> no evangelist has last year's at this time of the year. But anyhow, uh, it's an old thing. It's a Buick. It runs pretty nice. In fact, I think it's just about a perfect car. I got it very, very cheap, to tell you the truth about it. It has a built-in BC, you know, a cop dodger. And uh, it has a, a beautiful uh, 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 stereo system in it. And it's a comfortable, fairly comfortable riding car. As an automobile, it is perfect. If my good friend Dale calls me this afternoon and says, Brother Raven, I've got a tree here. I want you to knock it over with your bulldozer. I say, I don't have a bulldozer. He says, you've got a nice car there. And I say, all right, Dale, if that's all you want, let's go. Get it into 50 and I'm going to the tree. You know, somehow that tree ignores me. My car's all shattered and broken and smashed up. It's a perfect car when it functions in the area that it was made for. When I put it in another area, it's no good. It's not, it's not supposed to be a, a bulldozer. It's not supposed to be an armored car. It's supposed to convey my sweet wife and I wherever we are, the Lord tells us to go. Let me close with this. I, I don't know the reference right here. I thought of it earlier and I didn't, I didn't make it out. I'm getting old. I can't remember things so well. <clears throat> Do you remember the scripture, if you've got a, a concordance book for it? It talks about perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, how can you perfect what's perfect? Well, I think the simplest illustration is a, a baby. They don't always come on time. They don't <coughs> keep the right order as they should, but... Uh, <laughs> aren't you glad babies uh, I guess the dear brother Ed is and his wife I'm glad babies don't come like tadpoles wouldn't it be funny if you got a little uh, slimy little thing with a head and somebody says well don't be discouraged my dear it takes three months for the arms to grow <laughs> then after that it's going to have two little sprouts at the end which will become legs eventually you know this is, this is, this is evolution the body has to progress like no it's all gone on when that baby comes out you know Every birth is a miracle. People say sometimes, you know, yeah, I saw her baby. It's, it's not very pretty. Oh, boy, every baby to me is pretty. You know, when they come out, the, the, it's like a little boy went to see his sister in hospital. Mother said, yeah, now, come and, see your, come and see your sister. Oh, she's beautiful. Little guy went there and he saw this little red thing all wrinkled with its fists up like this. Ooh, he said, I don't wonder you kept it under your coat so long. It's so... <clears throat> It's so ugly. <laughs> well, that's the only way you can come in a world like this with your fists up because you're going to be fighting from here till you get to the end of the line anyhow. But you know, a baby's beautiful. The fact that, that, that a baby isn't crippled or cross-eyed or, or retarded. One of the things that hurt me most was when we were living in Minneapolis there were a couple of old ladies there and they kept a home just for mongoloid children and most of them were children of very extremely wealthy people. And we were in one day and the lady said, well, the, 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 the mother of this child came yesterday. She's a fabulously rich Jewish couple from Chicago. She comes up every four months to see the child. And all she does, she never touches it. She comes in and opens the door and just looks. And the same thing burst into tears and he almost has to carry his wife into the automobile. The, the, the birth is a miraculous thing. And it doesn't go through evolution. Evolution in the womb may be, but when the baby is born, here it is. Beautiful little squalling thing. The good ones always cry two o'clock in the morning. But then, so cheer up, Ed. But uh, here it is. It's perfect. As I say, wouldn't it be something if you had to wait three months for hands to grow and six months for legs to grow? Hmm? And it was born without a nose and you wonder what in the world is going to develop there? And it gets one year after it's two years old and another year after it's four. That would be a horrible, painful process. The baby is perfect. As a baby. For instance, it's got a brain, but it has no knowledge. It has no education. It has no wisdom. But it has all the potential in that mind that you can develop. And don't wait till it gets six years of age. Start teaching it when it's two years of age at least. One of our boys could read before ever he went to school. I think two of them could. Martha worked with them. The kids could read before they went. They would have jumped ahead all the time when they went to school. Why? Because mother took care of them. But you see, the brain is there, but knowledge is not there. If you're musical, you'll teach your child to play something. You'll get families where everybody plays an instrument. Why? Because daddy and mommy are musical. 
I go to a family and the, and the father is an artist and the children are artists. Why? They've copied daddy. Daddy's instructed them. That child has a, a whole, uh, let me put it in this simple way, and I, uh, simple because I don't know any better. It has a whole gold mine resident in it. You've got to dig that mine. You've got to get all working that's in that child. So you've got a brain, you've got a perfect child, it's a perfect baby. Nobody can fault it. It may not win a beauty competition, but it's got everything a child should have. It's got a head, feet, legs, nose, eyes, mouth, everything. Physically beautiful. It's got a brain, you discover it begins to respond. But you add to that child. You take it and you give it some intuition. You give it, family, you give it some teaching, some tuition. And from that it develops intuition. You find it, it, it's got a, a, a mind, it wants to study science, or it wants to study something else. You've got all the potential in the mind of that child. Now you have to develop it. You can pray your head off and praying in itself won't do it. You've got to do some work on it. But you may have a genius on your hand. You may have another Spurgeon on your hand. You may have a, a scientist, an inventor, you don't know. But it's all resident there. Now again, as I said yesterday, there's no finality to the Christian life this side of eternity. I'm still learning. Bernard Shaw, the old red-bearded rebel from Ireland, said when he was got to 80 years of age, I, I, I'll be dying soon and this is not right that I should die. He said, a man should live to be 300. Your brain doesn't start waking up till you're 80. Well, I didn't know he's waking up when he was 80, but by the same token, uh, it, it, I understand what he means. It, it's difficult to get through to young people like you that the most precious thing you have after your experience of God in Christ, I say it's the most ex precious anyhow, it's time. If you say, well, I'm, I'm 20, I have another 50 years, eh? oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. You may die as early as Brainerd at 29, or Robert Mary McShane at 28 and 29. Oswald Smith did a, a, a fantastic amount of work. He never wrote a book. His wife took all his studies, but he died at, uh, what was it, 43. Spurgeon was in his 50s, I think, when he died. Tozer was only 65. You see, the great thing, if you and I should die conscious, is surely this, that like the Lord Jesus, and how long did he live? Hmm? Well, in the truest sense of the word, he only lived three years. The other uh, 30 years, he was a laborer. Would you like to go shut yourself up in a log cabin and say to your wife, if you've got one, or if you're going to have one, well, look, sweetheart, we're going in a log cabin. We're not, we don't need a car. I know people who have done this. I'm fed up of society. It's corrupt. They don't want to raise children here. They've gone up in the hills and got a cabin, and there's a stream flowing past, and they live off the stream, and they live off the products. One of the great men in Wall Street did this. He's gone into Canada and he's taken a, uh, there's a stream come down the side of the hill. He, he has a big old log cabin there and he says, I'm the happiest man I've ever been in my life. I got rid of Wall Street and all the headaches. And he said, my refrigerator is a hole dug in the side of the hill. My bathroom, I bring it every morning with two buckets of water. I have a radio to keep in contact with the rest of the world and I'm happy. I'm free from all the accoutrements of modern life. Well, you may not want to live that way. I'm not saying it's the only way to be spiritual, or that if you do that, you'll be spiritual. It's like people say, well, do you think if I keep the Ten Commandments, you'll be spiritual? No, but if you're spiritual, you'll keep the Ten Commandments. And now, I'm sorry, I didn't mean just the Ten Commandments. I mean these commandments, let's say, eight commandments, the Beatitudes. Keeping the Beatitudes sublime, beautiful, majestic, glorious as they are, like jewels to me, all of them, like pearls round a lady's neck, if you want. They're the essence of the uh, teaching of Jesus. They actually are the constitution of his government. I think this is why they begin here in Matthew. Why did they begin in Matthew? Because when Jesus gave them, maybe in the crowd there, there were these great, big, dignified Roman soldiers. Can you imagine how the folk in the crowd of the disciples must have hurt when he said, you see the big guy there with the plume in his head, feather there, and the breastplate, if he stops you tomorrow and says, pick up my bag, drop your groceries and take my bag. And you have to go a mile and uh, try to carry your own and you start dropping your own groceries, you can't stop and pick them up. You carry his load. And when you get to the legal boundary, you say to him, sir, do you mind if I carry it further? That's pretty rough, isn't it? But that's what Jesus said. If he compels you to go a mile, say, well, praise the Lord, I'll go two miles, brother. And he says, what in the world have I got here? That's not the way the world lives. That's not the way that the world wants to live. 
the thing that makes the world mad is this is the answer to all our problems that man can't do it God does it we'll go to hell before we let God do it in us isn't it amazing that Jesus is trying to get through to them listen fellas listen listen I've come to set up the kingdom not in castles and mansions the kingdom of God is within you you're going to have a godlike disposition the kingdom of God is within you do you know how much they learned of that? I'll tell you how much they learned of it. Now, honest, I never thought of this till last night or early in the morning. I don't know which it was. I'll tell you just how much they, they got hold of the truth he was saying. That's why I tell you they were a disgusting bunch. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 6, six pardon me. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They were still wanting the kingdom. They like to hear him say, you're the children of David. Oh, you're going to set up the kingdom again, eh? And we'll be rulers. And through all his teaching, and his death and resurrection, they were still saying, before he ascended, you're going to return the kingdom to us, eh? You're going to tread the Romans out and push others. He must have been awfully disgusted with them. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. And they're all in this wonderful chapter. So we'll explore it tomorrow. Thank you.